Well, I want to talk to you about an idea, uh, since it's the night of ideas, about humane technology. But to understand what's humane, I want to first talk about what's not right, what's inhumane about technology. So if you could roll the video, please, first. I check my phone a lot. I check it usually when I wake up in the morning. Playing a game. I'm constantly checking my phone until I go to bed. I think it's a mixture of everything that's on social media that makes it so cool. Stories or bitmojis or gifts. Teams want to try out the new feature. They want to be on the cutting edge of the technology that's coming out. There is a lot of pressure to present a, a version of yourself that's close to perfect. If I'm doing my homework on my laptop, I might be in a room and checking my phone. Sometimes if I just get too bored of my homework, I might play like Candy Crush or something. But I feel like I'm distracted a lot. I procrastinate a lot. I have definitely been emotionally affected by social media, maybe even depressed. Um, but it's hard to say which causes what in time. I sometimes wish that it wasn't a thing so I could just hang out with my friends and play basketball or do other things like that. So, thank you. Um, how many of you relate to that video? <laughs> um, so, I want to tell you a story about how I got into doing this work and, and where this video came from. Um, I actually, myself, I'm very distracted. I got very distracted by technology, very addicted. Um, I was actually a tech entrepreneur here in San Francisco. And um, I had a startup. And I had been using technology a ton. We got acquired by Google, so my company got bought by Google. And I was sitting there checking my email all the time. Have you ever done a thing where you pull the refresh for email and then less than like a minute later you pull the refresh it again? Um, you know, it's easy to dismiss all these things that are happening with technology because they're so part of our lives, they're so weaved into the ways that we live. But I think there's something really profound about the changes that are happening that I started to notice when I was at Google. So, I want to tell you kind of how we got into doing this work. This video came from Common Sense Media. Uh, Common Sense Media is a nonprofit here in San Francisco that does work on children's and screens. Uh, it was a Truth About Tech campaign. And the point of this video was to show that um, these things that are happening to children and to all of us are not by accident, but they're actually by design. There is an intention um, behind the people behind the other side of the screen, where they want you to use the product as much as possible, as uh, Jeremy Lanier was just saying. And my background as a, as a kid was I was a magician. Um, and I'm telling you that because what is magic about? If you think about when you know, Jaren talks about manipulation, right? Facebook's trying to manipulate you, manipulate you into using it. But um, as a magician, what does it take to manipulate you? Do I have to know if you're a PhD in aerospace engineering? Do I have to know everything about aerospace engineering to manipulate you? No. So as a magician, what does it take to manipulate you? It just takes knowing people's weaknesses. It knowing, you have to know their blind spots. So when I was a kid, I was only like 10 years old, and I did magic shows, and I was fascinated that I could even be working with people with PhDs, and I could fool them. And so it says something kind of profound about human nature, that we're not the sovereign, strong people and identities that we think we are, but maybe there's a back door to our minds that's uh, vulnerable. And that's what this is about, that if you, you know, how many of you here work in the tech industry, by the way? Okay, wow, a lot. So there's a different message I'm going to get for you tonight. Um, because you're really part of the change that's going to make this happen. So that's the big idea for tonight. Um, in the tech industry, there's a lot of talk about the future of artificial intelligence. And when is the point at which technology is going to get so smart, getting smarter and smarter and smarter, that it's going to cross the threshold of now it's smarter than human strengths, right? 
artificial intelligence, the singularity, I mean, you guys have heard about this? And while we get obsessed with and sell $10,000 conference tickets at Davos to talk about the future of AI and when it surpasses human strength, there's a much earlier point in which technology surpasses human weaknesses. Right? It's like a, a critical threshold that what happens when technology is not smarter than your strengths, but it's smarter than your weaknesses? And that's the point that we're living in today. Because there's so many things that people are complaining about with technology. There's privacy, there's uh, addiction, there's kids' mental health issues, there's uh, Cambridge Analytica and Russian hacking. But I almost think of it like before there was climate change. Before there was climate change, there were just some people studying coral reefs and looking at coral reefs for bleaching. They said, why are these coral reefs bleaching? And then there's some other people over here and looking at why are we losing all these species in the Amazon? And then there's some other people over here looking at some other environmental factor. And there was no thing called climate change that was tying these things together. And I think of what's going on in technology the same way. We have hurricane tech addiction, we have hurricane Cambridge Analytica, and we have hurricane deep fakes and post-truth. We don't know what's true anymore. But hurricane tech addiction, hurricane uh, deep fakes, and hurricane post-truth, and hurricane Cambridge Analytica are actually all drawn by one factor which is when technology crosses the, the critical threshold of human weaknesses. So, when, after being a magician as a kid, I actually studied at a lab at Stanford called the Persuasive Technology Lab. Do, do people here know what the Stanford Persuasive Technology Lab is? A few? Um, so it's a lab at Stanford that I studied with the other founders of Instagram. And, um, and many other students, and we learned how to apply everything there is to know about persuasion to technology. So if you were trying to get someone to work out at the gym, or to be healthy, or to floss, uh, how would we apply the principles of persuasion to get you to do it? And we studied clicker training for dogs, so you know you go click, click, click after the dog gets the food. Uh, we studied casino design, slot machines, uh, we studied social manipulation, cults, all these kinds of things. And there was one class in this lab where we talked about the future of the ethics of persuasive technology. Specifically, what would happen if for every single mind on Earth you had a profile, like a personal profile, of what that mind was vulnerable to. So when you're delivering a message, you wouldn't just deliver any message, you would know that that mind responds to authority. So if I said, oh, well, the Harvard Center for Sleep says that this is true, that mind would respond more. Or if that mind really believes in their friend Susie, then I would say, well, Susie says that this thing is true, and that would cause you to believe. And there was a, this was a student project, and I remember hearing this, this is in 2006, by the way, and I remember saying, that is really dangerous. And what is the ethics of persuasive technology when technology knows more, not about your strengths or your mind or your knowledge, but about your weaknesses? And all of these things that are going wrong in technology today, the business model is it's driving it of advertising, but it's actually about this, press, this, this critical threshold of when technology starts to break through human weaknesses. That's also the same thing with distraction, information overload, because at the end of the day, there's only so much attention out there. Right? We used to have an a, a information scarcity problem. There wasn't enough access to information. But now we have all this abundant information, and so something else becomes really scarce and finite. And that something else is attention, because attention is what consumes information. That's what Herbert Simon said uh, back in the 1970s. So, um, because there's only so much attention, it's going to get more competitive. It used to be you just had to you wanted people to come to an event like this, there weren't that many events in San Francisco, so you would put up some flyers. That was the attention economy, just offer things. But now, we're saturated. There isn't any attention left. So if you want to take attention, you have to shove the other guy out of the way and actually get that attention in a more aggressive way. And so, as I've said many times, it becomes this kind of race to the bottom of the brainstem to figure out how do we get attention. So if you're going to go lower on the brainstem than I am, use moral outrage in a newsfeed story, that will win. 
And specifically what's going wrong with this now is that we pointed supercomputers at people's brains to extract attention. It used to be we just used these tricks like Snapchat streaks or red dots on things or your friend tagged you in a photo. Now we use supercomputers. So have you ever landed on a YouTube video and you hit play and you think right before you hit play, I'm going to watch this one video and then I'm done. <laughs> And then you wake up two hours later, and you're like, what the hell just happened to me? And it's because you had a supercomputer pointed at your brain. So when you hit play, you realize you just activated billions of dollars of YouTube and Google supercomputer infrastructure to activate an avatar voodoo doll version of you in this Tron-like environment. They don't have to feed that voodoo doll. They don't have to, you know, it doesn't sleep. They just wake it up and they test a hundred billion variations of what are the videos that if I play these hundred billion variations, which videos would get you to stay? And it knows a lot more about what will get you to stay than you know about you. Much like if you play Gary Kasparov at chess, the best human chess player, why do you lose? Because he sees more moves ahead on the chessboard than you can see. But when Gary Kasparov plays chess against the best computer chess player, he loses because the computer sees more moves ahead than him. And when he loses, it's not just checkmate for him, it's checkmate for all of humanity for all time for chess. Because that was the, the, the threshold of how far humans could think ahead in the future. So now we have a situation where two billion people use YouTube. That's about the number of followers of, actually uh, more than the number of followers of Islam for 60 minutes a day. And 70% of what people watch on YouTube is driven by the recommendations. The chief product officer at YouTube said exactly a year ago that we now have 60 minutes of people's days because our recommendations are getting that good at showing you the next thing. And what this, so far there's not an automatic harm here, but the problem is what goes into those recommendations? What does the YouTube algorithm think will keep your attention? So imagine there's a spec, you have the calm Walter, Walter Conkite science section of YouTube, right? Calm, rational discussion. And the other side, you have crazy town. You have Bigfoot, UFOs, 9-11 conspiracy theories, crazy stuff. If I'm YouTube, and you land anywhere on the spectrum, which way, if I want you to stay, am I going to steer your attention? Like this way, right? Which means that YouTube tilts the entire playing field of two billion people's attention. So no matter where you start, it always brings you somewhere more crazy. So a teen girl, as you saw in this video, who starts on a dieting video, will be shown anorexia videos, because those are more extreme. It's a real uh, issue. Uh, someone who watches a 9-11 news video will be shown 9-11 conspiracy theories on YouTube. YouTube has shown uh, Alex Jones conspiracy theories 15 billion uh, times, recommended. Um, there's only, um, if only one out of a thousand people believe that, uh, that's still printing a cult about the size of Scientology once a month, which is an insane amount of, of influence. Um, if you watch a, a story about the moon landing, it'll show you flat earth conspiracy theories, so much so that the famous basketball player Kyrie Irving said recently that he believed the earth was flat because he fell into a YouTube rabbit hole. And when he later was on, actually, KQ, not KQD, he was on NPR, and he said, I want to recount that the earth is not flat, I, I, I'm sorry, I, I got thrown into a YouTube rabbit hole. The students in a classroom that had heard this story said, oh, the round earthers had gotten to him. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> which shows you a really important fact, which is that some kinds of changes are temporary. When you feel temporarily lonely or addicted to your phone, that's an easy one to fix. But then other kinds of changes are tilting the world towards crazier and crazier, more paranoid beliefs, which is why we want to prevent them, as opposed to waiting on the other side. So while this might seem really pessimistic, I want to finish up. The premise of this is technology is not aligned with the limits, the paleolithics of human nature. And E.O. Wilson, the famous father of sociobiology, said that the problem of humanity is this. We have paleolithic emotions, we have medieval institutions, and we have godlike powers. We have one choice, which is basically how do we align technology with our paleolithic instincts? Because we don't get to choose whether or not we're vulnerable to social approval. 
we don't get to choose whether we're vulnerable to flattery. We don't get to choose whether we're vulnerable to variable schedule slot machine reward. That's how we work. So how do we design the technology to align with that? And that's what we call humane technology. And while this might seem pessimistic, I want to just quickly say that in the last year, last two years, I've been working on this topic for about six years, and um, about four years ago I gave a TED talk about time well spent on a stage in Brussels, and to try to illuminate this problem. And four years later, just this last year, exactly one year ago, in January 2018, Mark Zuckerberg made the new goal for Facebook to make sure that the time people spend on Facebook is time well spent. And Google and Apple both launched digital well-being initiatives to basically become in a, in a competitive race to the top for who can help basically protect the users' well-being. How did this happen? It happened because people like you, who are in the tech industry or around here, talked about the problem. And we had language for it. And if we go from a world where no one talks about the problem, so you have three meetings in one day, you're a Facebook or a Google or a Twitter product manager, and you walk into three meetings in one day and people say, have you heard of Time Well Spinner, have you heard of Humane Technology? That's enough to shift the conversation. So, we can change this, we have to change it, and uh, thank you all for uh, listening.